Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to another FPNA Trends webinar. Uh, it's really global today. We have uh, representatives of more than 68 countries, and we have more than 700 registrations as well. And no, uh, it's uh, no wonder because the subject is very interesting. Uh, it's about FPNA data visualization moving from insight to impact. My name is Larissa Malnichuk. I'm Managing Director at FPNA Trends Group and International FPNA Board. Uh, just a quick reminder about, um, uh, about the agenda for today. So we will define uh, what is FPNA data visualization. Uh, we will look at notation rules for effective dashboarding uh, and implementation of those dashboards. And also we will know why CFOs don't like it to be colorful. Uh, then the next subject is how to enhance your story with visualization, presenta pre presentations and data visualization and practice. And then importance of technology in leveraging uh, FPNA visualization. Of course, we will have Q&A session and then uh, there will be conclusions and recommendations as well. And now it's a good uh, time to introduce to you our international panel. Uh, I would like uh, to ask our panelists to switch on their cameras, please, and to switch on their microphones as well. Hello, everyone. So let me start from uh, Jürgen Feist, managing partner at IBCS Institute. Uh, many of you know Jürgen. He presents at so many different events, and he uh, one of those who actually implemented uh, and managing uh, the international business communication standards at the Institute. Uh, Jürgen uh, is a writer of uh, game-changing books, and also he is a very keen and very professional musician. And uh, definitely visualization, it's something uh, similar to music. Jürgen joins us today from Germany. Jürgen, welcome. Welcome to FPNA Trends webinar. Thank you, Larissa. Looking forward to a great webinar today. Thank you, Jürgen. Uh, our next panelist, uh, you may know him as well because Ron presented at a number of uh, webinars. So Ron Monteira, who is Corporate Senior uh, Director of FPNA at Kruger Products. Uh, Ron is um, ambassador and uh, also a member of our FPNA board in Toronto. And he has a lot of experience in uh, different leading organizations at FPNA and in particular uh, FPNA storytelling and practical experience on FPNA storytelling. But besides this, Ron uh, likes uh, to lecture uh, about the latest trends in FPNA and uh, storytelling as well at a number of universities and colleges. And uh, today he is going to share with us his practical experience on visualization and storytelling. Ron, join us from Toronto. Ron, you're welcome. Thank you, Larissa. I'm looking forward to a fantastic hour. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, okay. The next presenter is uh, Michael Langenfelder. Uh, Michael uh, has more than 15 years of experience uh, working for a software company and actually uh, developing the communication rules within this company and uh, application design. So he started 15 years ago with a provider and then when company was acquired by Unit4, he continued this journey. I'm very passionate about technology and what technology can bring to uh, storytelling and to visualization in particular. Michael uh, joins us from uh, Vienna, Austria. Uh, Michael, you're welcome. Thanks a lot, Larissa. Um, thanks for having me. Looking very much forward to our session. Thank you so much, panelists. Uh, before you start your presentation, just a few general slides so you can switch off your cameras and go on mute. Uh, just a quick introduction of uh, FPNA Trends Group. As you know, we uh, have chapters in 27 cities, 16 countries, four continents. We are, we are planning to restart uh, and even um, uh, restart our face-to-face -face meetings from the second half of the year. But so far, we are traveling digitally. And also, uh, the latest news for us, we started um, FPNA strategic and advisory and research, pa research partnership as well. A little bit about this webinar. So one hour, we will have two polling questions. It would be a feedback from you in order to understand where you are 
we will have interactive Q&A session. And please use the chat box uh, in order to start. Uh, you, you can start sending questions straight away after the first presentation. Our presentations right now available in your handouts, so you can download them. But you also will receive a recording and uh, the presentation after the meeting. And please uh, take part um, in survey after the meeting. It's so important for us to understand your feedback. And before we start uh, our session, I would like to say thank you so much uh, to our sponsor of today, Unit4. Uh, this is the company which is one of the world's leading provider of powerful corporate performance management solutions and rich business intelligence as well. So all of those capabilities that needed for optimization of FPNA function. Thank you so much, Unit4. And just a few slides from my side. Um, when we prepared for this meeting, uh, you know, uh, there, there, there were a lot of conversations and discussions, but I would like to start uh, this uh, today's session with this uh, quote from incredible person, Professor Hans Rosling, who is statistician, but at the same, he is data visualization genius. He compares data visualization with music, and this is his quote. Most of us need to listen to the music to understand how beautiful it is. But often that's how we present statistics. We just show the notes, we don't play the music. I don't know if you had an opportunity to see his uh, very famous presentation. Uh, so he presented in only four minutes, with help of visualization, 200 years of industrial shift in 200 countries. And it's definitely the music with uh, visualization. But then uh, when we look at uh, the real life visualization, especially for finance, very often we can find ourselves with something like this. You see, it's very difficult to find the signals, a lot of information, a lot of colors, and then uh, a lot of noise as well. And the next quote is coming from another uh, thought leader in visualization, Stephen Few, author and thought leader in the area. So to find the signals in data, we must learn how to reduce the noise, not just the noise that resides in the data, but also the noise that resides in us. And today we are going to look at these uh, three sides of FPNA storytelling, uh, obviously with uh, the accent on data visualization. So the narrative, uh, the data and the visuals. And with this, I think it's a good uh, timing to start the first presentation. Jürgen, you're welcome. Please switch on your camera. And uh, we are going to uh, hear uh, why CFOs don't like this colorful. Jürgen, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Larissa. And thank you for the great introduction with the slides from Hans Rosling and Stephen Few, um, two of the, the genius in data visualization I really adore. And um, I would like to follow up with what Stephen Few said, um, that we need to reduce the noise. And I think this is the first thing we need to do before we start uh, playing the music and telling the great stories with the music. And this is why I think we need some notation rules for effective dashboard implementation. And this is why I would say CFOs don't like it colorful. And I want to show you what I mean with that. On the next slide, you see a sales dashboard. It's just a gray, black, and colorful dashboards about sales. I do not want to judge on that one. I just want to show you on the next slide another sales dashboard. And what I want to say is there have been two sales dashboards and they look completely different. Completely different. And this is the problem. If we ask Google, the result is on the next slide. Please show us some, some dashboards. What we get is a collection of completely different looking dashboards. Nothing in common. Not the least. They just look completely different. And this is actually the opposite of what we have in other disciplines. As Larissa mentioned, I'm a passionate musician. So on the next slide, you see what we get if we ask Google for sheet music. And you see, it's sheet music from different countries, from different centuries, but it looks somehow the same. And the reason why it looks the same is because there is something, something behind this 
this uh, sheet music, and this is a notation. Now, if we move forward, we see that we have um, uh, this notation in two aspects. One aspect is the, the labeling of, we are, of what we are looking at. In music, in sheet music, it's always the same thing. We have the title of what we are playing on the first page in the middle um, at the top. We have the composer to the right. We have an arranger underneath it. We have the instrument here, the piano on the left-hand side, and we have the speed in which we need to play above the first bar. It's always the same in every single sheet of music. Now look at your reports and look at your dashboards where you have all the labeling. So why don't we, as on the next slide shown, have a standardized, a unified title for all pages, charts, and tables? In the first line, we name the the reporting unit. In the second line, we talk about the measure and the measure unit. And in the third line, we mention the period and probably the scenario, whether we are looking forward, having some scenario planning, or whether we have um, just actual data. So this is rule number one, our notation rule number one. So on the next slide, you see that this Warsaw Concerto we have been looking at is also completely in black and white. This is what Stephen View meant when he wanted to reduce the noise. We, we just have reduced everything in music that is not necessary. And the same is on the next slide, which what we have in, 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 in electric engineering. Or on the next slide, if you look at architecture, if you just look at a construction plan, it's always the same. They absolutely reduce it to the minimum. The notation is the absolutely minimum that is necessary to get it across. This is uh, reducing the noise. And if they use color, as on the next slide in, in, in road signs, when they use color, then they use color for purpose, not for decoration, but for purpose. Here they use the red color as a warning color. So the stop sign is in red. This is the point where my, my colleague, uh, Professor Rolf Hichert, um, just came up with an idea. Why don't we do the same thing in business communication? Why don't we, we just uh, have a notation where things that mean the same consistently look the same. For instance, if we if we set up a second rule, this is the next slide. If we set up a second rule, um, so um, the, the 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 next slide, please. Um, if we set up a second rule, and the second rule is about variances. When we talk about variances then we make them red and green. I think that's a simple rule and probably you already do that. And the next rule on the next slide is that we then probably have a blue or an additional color for all height lighting, but we do it consistently. If we decide to do it blue, then it's always blue. The next uh, rule is about the different data types, data sets we have. We call them scenarios. You have actual data, you have planned data, you have forecasted data. So why don't we consistently show actual data with a solid feel, whereas planned data, things that probably will happen in future, are just outlined. And if something is in between, if it's a forecast, we just paint it hatched. Why don't we do that? And with only those four rules, we will already get um, part of the way. Actually, as you see on the next slide, there are much more rules. If you are interested, just go to ibcs.com and uh, on ibcs.com slash standards, you will find those standards, you can register, you can discuss with the IBCS Association, which is just an open, it's like Wikipedia, you know it from Wikipedia. It's a creative common thing where the community of the, of the business analysts worldwide defines their own language. So visit us on ibcs.com and register. If we then apply those rules, uh, we just can scroll through some, some reports. So on the next slide, for instance, you see just a column chart. And on the next si slide, you see a waterfall chart. And on the next slide, you see a table with an integrated waterfall, a vertical waterfall. And you see it's all looking pretty similar. So that finally, 
if we ask Google again, show, and show us some IBCS compliant reports, this is what we get. And you see, it's pretty close to where we wanted to go because on the next slide, we compare it again with sheet music. And you see, if we just apply those notation rules, we come pretty close to that idea. And the good thing is, if we apply that, then there has been a, a, a study from a Technical University Munich together with Blue Ford. And on the next slide, you see the result of, of this study. They realized that people that are have been acquainted with this IBCS notation and use IBCS notation, they will make 61% less errors after reading the reports, and they are 46% faster in understanding that report. So this is really great news. So on the next slide, if you are interested in getting deeper into that, you probably are interested in the book Solid Outline Attached, where we explain that. And I hope I could convince you that CFOs don't like it colorful, but they want it consistent. And now I'm looking forward to the comments of Ron and Michael. Uh, Jürgen, thank you so much uh, for sharing with us how we can uh, make our presentations, visualizations as a music with this uh, international business communication standards. Uh, I would like to ask Ron uh, to comment on this. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Jürgen, fantastic presentation. And uh, it's, it's a great provocation. And uh, it's funny, a few months ago, I had this exact experience where my uh, CFO actually said, hey, there's too much color on the page. So I've actually had a real life situation of that. And, and I love the provocation of, of getting to a standardized approach. And the music analogy to me is actually perfect. And, and where, why I think it's perfect is it really advances our conversation. And it gets us to more important things rather than having our stakeholders spend a lot of time orienting themselves to our individual personalities. So uh, I love it. I think it's fantastic. And, and the other thing is I think less is more is also a powerful message and it's very hard because a lot of times we have the temptation to equate a lot of detail with good uh where some it's, it's actually harder sometimes to go less is more so thank you jürgen fantastic presentation thank you thank you ron michael uh what would be your commentary yeah <clears throat> i can only agree um thank you Jürgen, for your presentation um to be honest, when, when we look a little, um, or when I look a little at my own presentation, uh, the third one that will come, you will be able to tell that we have been following uh, Jürgen's uh, work and the standards of IBCS because we fully agree. So I couldn't agree more uh, to the principles uh, that Jürgen outlined. And maybe a critical reflection also uh, coming from um, an FPNA software uh, vendor, um, I I clearly agree that we need software for a purpose, and this purpose should not be just being flashy, colorful. So thank Excellent. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, Ron, and Jürgen, once again, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Now, uh, this is the time uh, to hear what is happening uh, in the world in the visualization of our participants. Uh, I'm launching the polling question. And I would like uh, to ask uh, our participants to start voting uh, as soon as you see those following questions. So uh, which of the following statements is the best description for your current report or dashboard? And there are several options. Please choose the one which is the best description for you. The first option is no consistency. All reports, dashboards look different. Uh, the second option is some departments have established some level of consistency. The third option, uh, all reports dashboards have to adhere to corporate design. Uh, the fourth option, all reports dashboards have to adhere to corporate manual. And our reports are IBCS compliant. So please continue to vote. I can see that more than 60% of you voted just a few seconds. Uh, and I'm closing the poll and I'm sharing the results. I'm sharing the results. You can see them straight away. So 26% no consistency, 54% already some consistency, 70% uh, have the corporate design and all the uh, 
uh, all the visualization should should be uh, adhered to this corporate design. One percent it's about uh, the corporate menu, and only two percent are following IBCS compl compliance. Uh, Jurgen, what would be your commentary on this? Well, actually, it's not too much a surprise. So let's start with the last one that only two percent. Um, already have IBCS in place. This is not a surprise. It's more a surprise that there are already 2% because this is a, a pretty new initiative. So what's the good news on that result is the second answer, that more than half of the answers have already established some level of, of consistency. So at least they see the potential of consistency and this is a good start if you see the potential to probably get broader and broader and adopt a, a standardized notation as IBCS provides it. So I think it's good news. We are on a good way. Thank you, Jürgen. Uh, I would like uh, to ask Ron. Ron, what would be your take on this, on those results? Yeah, I think uh, just building on Jürgen's commentary, I'm I'm not surprised either. So I think I'm I'm probably in in my organization in that green bar as well, in the 54%. So I'm in the majority. But I think what I would love to see is if you know we have a similar webinar next year on this, we see more and more people gravitating towards the bottom half of this slide. And obviously, getting to that compliance on IBCS and standardization would be uh, a big step forward for us as an FPNA community. So. Not surprised, and I think there's uh, you know some real optimism as Jurgen said, and you know uh, you know a great chance for us to improve as a total community. Uh, thank you, Ron, uh, and thank you everyone who voted. Uh, I'm hiding the results, and now let us look at uh, FPNA visualization from the practitioner point of view. So, how to enhance your story with the visualization? Uh, and we have a uh, Ron. Uh, who is going to share with us his practical experience. Ron, you're welcome. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see uh, what I'm going to start with. And, uh, you know, in life, uh, you know, this saying is used a lot. A picture is worth a thousand words. And I believe it's really applicable to business as well. And, and you know, to build on, on Jürgen's presentation, I think it's really about you know, pictures, standardization, st standardization of visualization will really advance the conversation. And I'll tell you exactly what I mean by that. On the next slide, you'll see what I will be covering. So the first thing is the first key to effective visualization, in my opinion, is really understand and cater to your audience. And I'll use a very specific example a few years ago where I was working with this vice president, uh, you know, what brilliant member of the organization. And I would spend two to three weeks building this what I thought was a fantastic presentation uh, with you know, 20 to 30 pages of very, very good content. Uh, it, but it probably wasn't using that you know, term terminology of less is more. Uh, and I remember really having a challenge with that stakeholder. Uh, and I remember having a really great mentor who basically made me reflect on it and said, hey, think about that vice president and imagine how much data and information is coming at him every single day. And he gave me some great advice to simplify. And I actually simplified it to a one page, very visual uh, document, which basically gave him you know, the summary of here's what's going well, and here's what we need to focus on. And almost instantaneously, my relationship with that individual and our business results together uh, improved dramatically. Uh, and then the other side of the coin is my very next vice president who I worked with was exactly the opposite. So he would actually probably want a 50 page presentation. Uh, but obviously I used my professional judgment and we found a good compromise. But the number one thing is really understanding who is your audience and how do you make it catered to your audience to make it much more effective, that being the presentation. The second thing is around delivering a quick understanding. So whenever you, uh, back to the previous slide for a second. So if you think about a quick understanding of the data, that will really help us all as stakeholders get to the important discussion, which is point number three on this particular slide. And, and really what I think as an FPNA practitioner, as an FPNA leader, what we wanna do is have a goal of inciting quick understanding with the data that we present. And importantly, how do we get it to, what is the action we're gonna to take to capitalize on opportunities and risks? On the next slide, you'll see my first example. So obviously very rudimentary example. If you look at the top part of the page, just a row of numbers, okay? Obviously on this particular example, the stakeholder would have to manually look at it and try and ascertain what the key messages are. On the bottom, just a very simple visual, which says, 
you know, this is a business depicts, you know, a, a business that struggled during COVID. So imagine the first wave is in March of 2020. And as you're planning the budget, it becomes a really good provocation to say, we probably need to have a few scenarios to say, how are we going to attack Q1 to Q3 if the wave, if wave two or wave three, depending on where you're in the country, in, in the world, persist. So very simple visual to, that shows you how to advance the conversation. On the next slide, you'll see another example. So on this slide, you know, I was working in a manufacturing facility where we had three production areas. Now, I've just simplified A, B, and C. And on this, just a very simple chart of, of the revenue that these uh, individual departments were bringing in per week. If you, if you see the next slide, you'll see what we did. So, so my approach here, and, and you know, probably a little too much color for Jurgen's liking, but on the left side of the page, what we did was a couple of things. One is we said, okay, here's the target we need as a total organization depicted in the black line in order to hit profitability. Uh, and very quickly, you see in week four, week five, seven, eight, nine, and 11, we had profitable weeks. And in the other weeks, we did not have profitable weeks. So very clear to the management team, okay, here's the results. Here's where we did really well. Here's where we did not so well. And then on the right side of the page, we zoomed in and we said, look, here's how all the production areas did in those weeks. And it was very quick to see, hey, production A, area A is where we need to spend the most time. And we assembled a task force. We actually put a, you know, some of our best people on that. And if I showed you this chart you know, in week 25, week 26, it was a lot better. So we actually improved tremendously on production uh, area A. Uh, we knew there's some tweaking on B and we made some little changes uh, and C was somewhere in the middle. So just a very simple example where you see, hey, the data itself is not gonna send the message, but some effective visualizations can basically get an entire management team and organization to really take action uh, to improve. So very simple, uh, real example from my past. Next slide. Okay, so how do you get there? And, and that's the important thing. And I've had some great advice over time. Uh, and the first one is uh, one of my mentors used to always say, spend time in the data. She used to say, roll around in the data. And at the time, I didn't quite understand what that means, but I really do now. So if I have a presentation, for example, on a Friday, uh, and the, it's a month end, I actually have it this, this particular week, I spend the week really diving into the P&Ls, into the data, into the business units, into our products, and really start formulating the story in my mind. Uh, and as the week progresses, it, it really becomes really clear to me, here are the standard charts that we're going to include. And obviously, the goal would be to leverage Jurgen's approach and have a really standardized deck as a, as a shell. But importantly, then it's how do we enhance the story by providing additional visuals on areas that need additional for focus. So for example, if our variable costs or our pricing or advertising uh, was you know, above, significantly above or below budget, that would be an, you know, a, a provocation to add additional charts and support that story. Uh, and then lastly, you know, there's obviously a school of thought to say, what's the right visualization depending on what you're trying to show? And, and, and there's obviously some fantastic literature to say, when do you use a bar graph, a bubble chart, et cetera. So uh, I think it's a process that I've developed over time that we as FP&A individuals can really, really count on. Next slide. Okay, so uh, to, to summarize my, my presentation, I, I think visuals really enhance our ability to tell the story. It really advances the conversation to stakeholders trying to understand, to stakeholders collaborating and saying, hey, yes, we understand very clearly. How can we make a big impact with the business? Uh, storytelling, and we're talking a lot about the visuals. Uh, I know Michael's talking next about the, the, the data. The storytelling component is something I always talk about in these webinars to say that will continue to be of paramount importance. Uh, as I mentioned, quick understanding of the data and the business issue is very important. And the most important thing is how do you incite really quick action to capitalize on opportunities and address risks? So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, presentation and I'll turn it back to Larissa. Ron, uh, what a great story and thank you for sharing uh, your insights with us, your practical experience. Uh, I would like to ask uh, our panelists to switch on the camera and uh, to share your subject matter on this particular aspect of visualization. Jürgen, can we start from you? Sure. So thank you, Ron, for a great presentation. And actually, um, 
what you are uh, what what you are showing is pretty close to the idea of music you know what you showed us is that you talk about composition you talk about arrangement you talk about creating great music and playing that music as 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 uh, hans rosling said and in order to do so we need as a basic we need this standard notation so that the composers know how to bring their ideas down to paper and that the musicians that play that great music know how to read it. So this is actually the next step. So after having a great notation, I think uh, what you presented is the storytelling part and the, the looking forward part of it in order to get from from insight to impact. This is exactly what we would like su to support with the standardized notation. So thank you for showing that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jürgen. Uh, Michael, what would be what? your commentary? Thanks a lot, Ron, for, for the presentation. Uh, my summary um, in any presentation, uh, major factor, who is your audience? Always remind yourself, what's the purpose to whom am i presenting uh, the second one and that's usually how i approach it why are we looking at finance reports well, usually just to find out where are we overperforming where is it going really well where do we have issues and in both cases how do we become active after that solve the issues or recreate the success of the reports. And I think that's perfectly in line with, with what you um, just described. Thank you, Michael. Uh, is it a good time now to see, um, uh, to, to see what is happening uh, with visualization um, for, of, in the world of our practitioners? I'm launching the next polling question. And uh, it's about uh, the technology that you use or tools that you use for your um, uh, business visualization, FPNA visualization process. Uh, please, uh, can you choose uh, which of the following tools you predominantly use for your current FPNA visualization or storytelling process? Is it mostly Excel? Is it mostly FPNA software? Is it ERP or BI tool or maybe PowerPoint? Uh, please continue to vote. Uh, more than 50% of you already voted. Uh, please continue. Just a few seconds. Um, just a few seconds. More than 65% of you, almost 70%. I'm closing the poll. I'm sharing the results. Interesting results. Uh, actually, not surprising results. 46% still use Excel. Only 3% predominantly use FPNA software. 1% use ERP, BI tools 21% and 28% PowerPoint. Um, Ron, what would be uh, your commentary? Any surprises? Anything uh, you didn't expect to see? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little surprised that Excel is that high. I actually expected a little bit more of a balance between Excel and PowerPoint. But, you know, for me, it's a good provocation for us as a FPNA community to say, hey, how can we take our, our uh, entire area further along because I think there's significant opportunity if we move Excel beyond Excel and PowerPoint and, and me myself I'm I'm a combination of Excel PowerPoint mainly PowerPoint but I think there's a massive opportunity for us as an FPNA community thank you uh, thank you Ron Michael uh, I know how passionate you are about uh, the technology and what technology can bring in particular FPNA uh, solution so you can see that only 3% of people use uh, a FNA solution for uh, visualization. Um, yeah. Would you like to add? Yes, uh, you, Larissa, you, you see me crying a little bit in, bit in the background. Um, <laughs> that is on the one hand clearly disappointing, but um, as Ron uh, said already, there's huge opportunity and I'm very much looking forward um, to share uh, with you in the third presentation now how um, FPNA software can actually help you uh, with all those uh, topics of reporting storytelling that we've discussed so far that hopefully we can increase those 3% to a much higher number. Uh, thank you, thank you, Michael. And I would like to ask Jürgen to comment as well. So uh, is it something that you see um, around the globe as well, Jürgen? Well, um, what surprises me 
is that the, the percentage of BI tools is so low. I would have expected a much higher number at the BI tools. So the, 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 the tableaus and, and click views and, and, and you know all those tools out there. Um, so if you add together Excel and PowerPoint, it's by far more than the half. And this is really surprising from my perspective. So I would have expected more software support in data visualization. On the other hand, okay, there is potential to improve. Yes, definitely there is potential uh, to improve. Thank you for your commentary. And thank you so much everyone uh, for taking part in this um, uh, survey. Uh, and then let us look uh, at how technology can help us with uh, FPNA data visualization. So we have Michael here who is going to share with us his vision uh, and his experience on the subject. Michael, you're welcome. Thank you, Larissa. Well, then let's get started um, and move right into it on the first slide. Uh, what you can tell from just looking at this one, um, we have seen Jürgen's presentation beforehand a couple of times. Jokes aside, uh, about the storytelling, uh, this report um, shows a PL comparing current year versus previous year. You see in the little lines uh, the 12 month trend uh, for the two years in comparison. And we see the main sections of your PL all split out. So if you just look at this for each area, you can immediately start telling a story because it's easy to read. If we move to the next one, Larissa, um, a different visualization, but very similar format. This time we use deviations on this report with red and green, again, comparing those two periods to visualize where do we have positive, negative um, deviations when we compare uh, those two periods. If we move to the uh, next example, um, we add to the a similar fashion and you see again we have uh, grouped uh, bars uh, for the different periods with deviations in red and green, but we add an, a, a, an essential uh, component now, the commenting. And with commenting comes uh, collaboration because now you get people involved. They need to comment on the numbers in the system. They need to explain themselves why there is such a deviation. The next example is just uh, a similar uh, commenting option. In this example, we use uh, a waterfall. Waterfall are, in my opinion, a great tool of, of comparing uh, two things, um, especially periods. Um, and then having a nice bridge that explains what were positive effects and negative effects. In this um, example, it's the months. So what in what month did we see a positive performance or a negative one? And again, we can immediately comment. No additional tools uh, needed. It's all in the same FPNA platform. If we move to the next example. So far, um, the examples that I've shared with you were very much focusing on standardized reports. Now, I want, of course, also to talk about um, dynamic dashboards, which are interactive. And even though I can just you know, show you by little screenshots and zooming in, this is not rendered as well as in the real software, you get the idea. To the right top, you see the screen icicle chart, which visualizes revenues um, for a region with employees. If we now click on it, we will zoom in depending on where we click. Now we are um, on, a, on a country level. If we click in uh, again on a certain uh, state, you immediately can tell the story, right? You don't know the numbers, but you see in this state, um, the sales rep that is named first here makes 50% of the revenues in that state. Even if you didn't know the numbers, you could immediately start telling the story. So you have immediately understood the data. If we move on to the next example, again, a waterfall chart. This example comes from the retail industry. You see to the left, um, the personnel cost ratio that we had in budget. 
the personnel cost ratio is the ratio between personnel costs and revenues. To the very right, you see the same number uh, for the actuals. And the waterfall in between, well, that's a waterfall with logic, the system, this FPA system has calculated uh, with a business logic and explained the deviations. So to the left in the gray bar, uh, you have your uh, budget, your target. To the right, you have your actuals. Unfortunately, unfortunately, not everything that's bigger is better. So a higher personnel cost ratio obviously means you had more personnel costs in relation to your revenues. So this chart explains very easily, in, even if you're not a retail expert, that in this middle bar section for the hourly workforce, that's where you have the main issue in this current month that you're reporting. That's where uh, your problem uh, was, uh, why you didn't meet your uh, actual numbers mainly. We we'll move to the next example. Um, one of my favorite ones, that's one of the reports that we actually used within Unit 4 um, when in, in my role as uh, a, a finance VP uh, for some legal entities. That was one of the uh, most preferred reports because there's there are no secrets hidden anymore in this one. In the first column, you see the current full year forecast. Those numbers automatically generated by the system collected from many, many different users. One of the great advantages that you have with an FPNA uh, tool that's supporting you. Second column is budget, third column is previous year, and then you have your deviation columns, forecast, um, to budget and forecast to previous year. You immediately see where will we end up at the end of the year compared to budget and compared to previous year for all your p &L lines. If we click on the next one, we blow this report up with all the details. In the middle section now, you see the year to date. So you see how you've performed, and of course in the software you get that dynamically, at any given point in time during the year. You see with your actuals, your budget year to date and your previous year year to date, how did we perform to this point in time of the year? In the last section to the very right, you see the year to go. So you immediately can tell what's the total forecast, what has happened so far in the year and what's to come. We move on to the next one. Scenario planning, another great story where uh, um, FPNA software can truly help you, where you can quickly simulate in uh, scenarios, in, especially in, in COVID times or other crisis situations, quickly simulate business scenarios. And if we proceed to the next one, we then immediately get from the system um, an integrated PNL showing me what's the effect in the waterfall, in this case we compare our base case simulation to the COVID scenario where we see, okay, uh, in this simulated scenario we're going to get hit hard and if we move on in a good FPNA solution this will be fully integrated with your cash flow statement. Um, if we click to the next one uh, you then see immediately integrated your integrated cash flow statement. If we move to the last example, the storytelling. This is actually a, a practical example where all reporting and commenting is only done in uh, the software, in the FPNA software. No more Excel, no more PowerPoint. You have your starting dashboard. If you click on to the next one, you will see a highlight report for a, a CEO. He doesn't have to look through PowerPoint presentations anymore. He can immediately comment on the system. And what we like to say, um, your financial controllers who help prepare this, they are becoming more like journalists setting up the headlines in a newspaper. And we have one uh, other example from uh, the sample customer to see how this could look. If we click to the next one, that's the last example of this visualization. All right, if we sum it all up by clicking to the last slide, what's the practical advice that I can give? 
get familiar with the reporting standards uh, that Jürgen uh, introduced today. Find your own uh, standards, see what makes sense for you and adopt it. I hope I could shed some light on why it makes sense to have software, FPNA software, support you on this journey and make sure that you uh, collaborate uh, with commenting functionality. Find the right level of planning. I don't think there's a single uh, granularity and level for every company that's right. Find the right, find the right um, level of detail for your planning. We've made great experiences all over with value driver concepts, so I can strongly recommend uh, to use those. And don't let bad data quality be an excuse. Uh, in all honesty, it should be even more the reason for you to get started. Thank you. Michael, uh, thank you so much. A great example on uh, how technology can help with visual story and storytelling in general. Uh, thank you for sharing this with us. Uh, I would like to ask our panelists to switch on the cameras and uh, to comment very quickly. So, Jurgen, uh, anything to add to this presentation? Well, what I would like to add is I have seen the explanation why probably we have seen in the poll the result that so many people are using Excel and PowerPoint. Because the reason obviously is that the usual FPNA software and especially also just the, uh, the, the business intelligence software tools, they focus on the analytical part only. But they forgot in the past to add how to add comments, how to interact and how to communicate the findings to the people that are interested in that. And I really appreciate, Michael, in your presentation that you figured out that this part, let's call it a management newspaper or a management news portal or how, how I, I don't know how to name it, but this is actually what you showed. And I think this is the missing piece. And if we succeed in getting this piece in place in an integrated solution, we will finally get rid of PowerPoint and Excel we will see reducing shares of those two tools. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Jürgen, definitely. Uh, but uh, the process should be implemented properly as well, as Ron mentioned in his presentation. Ron, uh, anything to add here? Yeah, no, I think, thank you, Michael, that was great. And uh, for me, just the thought of having, you know, a great presentation as a starting point is, is really uh, appealing to me because it really advances our whole role as an FP&A community. And you spend a lot more time digging into the, into the story, understanding opportunities, looking at risks. So right now, you know, I probably spend more time on the creation of the PowerPoint document than that part. So uh, really appealing to me. I think it's a great provocation and, and that poll really tells the tale. 75% Excel and PowerPoint. So uh, yeah, really excited. And you know, hopefully as we do this next year and future years, we start really making that change. Thank you. Thank you again, Michael, for excellent presentation and for your commentaries, Ron and Jürgen. Uh, I would like uh, to uh, remind our participants uh, to send, to continue to send your questions. Uh, we are about to start the Q&A session and don't worry if we don't have enough time we will get back to you through email we will answer all of your questions uh, now before we start Q&A session uh, let us look at the key takeaways from each of the panelists uh, Jürgen your 30 seconds key takeaways from the session please well, thank you. I would like to use most my 30 seconds to invite you again to this community. I think if we have such a common language, it will help us. And we are not finished with this common language. So it's an open project. Join us on ibcs.com and start to comment on the things that are already there. I would really appreciate that. By the way, it's a good time. We are just preparing version 1.2 of the standards. So give us input to that. Thank you, Jürgen. Uh, Ron, your 30 seconds, please. Yeah, perfect. So I think it, it's been a really nice combination from Jürgen and, and Michael. And, and as I'm working on a presentation later this week, I think there's a lot of good nuggets to take with me. And, you know, for instance, the color, the CFOs don't love color. I think it's, it's just a simple, quick uh, implementation. But there's also the last part, which we talked about, about the FPNA software. Uh, and, and the provocation for me is us as FPNA individuals can be really real champions within an organization. And it's a high ROI project. 
right? So for me, uh, I really love the, you know, the content provided by Jurgen and, and Michael. And I think as an FPNA community, we can really advance. Uh, Michael, uh, your 30 seconds, please. Thank you, Ron. <clears throat> Don't lose time preparing data in Excel and PowerPoint. Let's use software. Let's uh, apply uh, standards as Jürgen has presented. And then we can focus on telling the story. Be journalists to your managers, as Ron um, has explained, and be active and improve our businesses. Uh, excellent conclusions, uh, excellent vision, everyone. And now this is the time for Q&A session. We already have a lot of questions coming your way. Uh, let me manage this for you. Uh, Jürgen, the first question is uh, for you. Consistency is a great concept, but what if you have many customers, many stakeholders for information, and they have their own preferences in terms of the visualization and standards they would like to use? Well, this is exactly the problem that we already have those preferences in place. This is the big difference to all other disciplines where they started to create this notation before preference have been in place. So we need to convince them that it's also an advantage for them if they probably change their preferences to a standard one, especially if they probably serve different purposes. If you are in a supervisory board for three or four companies, it would just be great to get the same reports from those three or four companies. And I think this is just obvious and everyone will understand that. Uh, thank you, Jürgen. Thank you so much. Ron, the next question is to you. Uh, in my organization, we are not into any of the software or, uh, and we are using traditional Excel for visualization. How we can encourage uh, our stakeholders and our management in investing and using uh, FPLA software and BI tools? Yeah, I think I think two things. One is, I mean, this webinar for me has opened my eyes a lot, right? So showing your stakeholders is one way, right? So I think, you know, the first thing is even getting your hands on, you know, something like we use today and saying, here's what is possible. And my history is when you show that and you show there's a much better way to do things, I think stakeholders start to take notice. And, and more importantly, I think there's a very high ROI on this and trying to figure out a way to do that. It's obviously somewhat abstract, but I think once you show the value that you can provide, uh, I think it's it's a no-brainer. It, it obviously is, is probably a process, but I think if you use a real standard process like that, I think you could get your stakeholders there. Thank you, Ron. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael, uh, the next question is to you. How do you balance visualization with detailed reporting uh, in the software? Because sometimes visualization tends to hide facts that could be important. So what would be your um, advice on this? I just have very little time. <clears throat> Again, find the right level of planning, the level uh, of detail that you need. Uh, the right level is the most granular one that you need for steering your company. So on that level where you want to compare actuals versus budgets and forecast, that's your planning level. And that should be, uh, in my opinion, the level that you run your FP&A solution or any other solution that you do your planning and forecasting within. Anything that comes below is very interesting and modern software and tools give you great um, opportunities to directly link them. So case in point, in, in, in our um, integrated tools, if you look at your our FP&A solution on an actuals value of $100,000 and you click on it, you immediately jump back into the ERP system, which you don't notice because it's just another browser report that pops up and you see all the details with individual transactions um, in the ERP system. So I think the FP&A and ERP solutions grow closer and closer together that this uh, integrated analysis down to an individual transaction um, is, is possible easily today. And the right level of planning should be the one where you run your forecasts and budgets. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. And now uh, the last question before we close Q&A session, but please uh, continue to send your questions. 
we will be able to answer in offline regime. So the question is uh, to all of you panelists. So what would be uh, the top three steps that you would recommend in implementing a FPNA data visualization? So uh, let us start from Jurgen. So what are the top three steps for uh, practical implementation of financial planning and analysis visualization, Jurgen? Mm -hmm. So um, following what I presented, um, my first step would be to create a so-called notation manual. If you really want to have consistency, whether it's a standard like I proposed or whether it's just consistency within your organization, you just need a notation manual where it's defined how things should look like. Then you need support from management because without management support, you won't be able to make the change. It's just a change management process and you need backup from management. And the third thing I would recommend is the third step, you need software. Without software, it doesn't work. You can't tell people, do it like this and do it like that. And the boss, by the way, had said we should do that, but they are just not able to do it because you did not give them the tools. So the three things, you need a concept in a notation manual, you need the, 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 the management support, and you need good tools. Those are my three recommendations. Thank you. Excellent recommendations, Jürgen. Ron, your practical recommendations, top three. Yeah, and I, honestly, I would echo what Jurgen said, right? It, it is getting to that first standardization documentation. Uh, and, and then the other piece becomes, uh, you know, obviously I talked about the ROI, the you getting the buy-in. I totally agree with Jurgen. You have to get buy-in from the management team. Uh, and, and that's where uh, it is a little tricky, right? Because you, you want to ensure they have input into the conversation. So trying to find that fine balance where you provide, you know, they provide input, but you're still going to end up at a really good standardized approach. Uh, and then it's it's also being realistic to say where in the pipeline is this going to come from a from a capital budget perspective. So I think, you know, practically speaking, I think there's some really good steps to get there, uh, and it may take some organizations a little longer and some organizations a little shorter. Excellent recommendations. Thank you, Ron. Michael, your recommendations, please. <clears throat> to be honest, it's it's a little boring, but <clears throat> Jürgen covered it um, at the beginning. I do think from the from the three steps that he said, I think the <clears throat> the middle one is the most challenging one to get uh, management over essential hierarchies aligned on this and push this through an organization. That's the critical thing. I think if you look for um, the reporting standards, you find them. If you look for software that can support you, you'll find it. The middle piece, it's uh, the tricky one. Excellent. Thank you so much for these uh, three steps. Uh, they are very logical and very valuable. And with this, I would like uh, to conclude our Q&A session for today. Uh, but before we uh, conclude our webinar, uh, let me remind uh, to all our practitioners, uh, to all our participants, that uh, we would like to invite you to those two events. The first one is webinar on the best practice in capital planning. And the second one, uh, it's about beyond budgeting philosophy. The one is uh, fantastic and um, what is happening in the world, what are the latest trends. And also we would like to invite you to take part in our uh, latest survey, survey for year 2021. If you would like to uh, receive your um, report and to understand where you stand, comparing to others, please take uh, this part uh, in this survey. It's a very quick one. And finally, um, I would like to say thank you so much uh, to our sponsor, Unit4. Thank you for supporting us with this webinar. I would like to say thank you so much uh, to all our participants for being here with us. And finally, thank you so much, our great panelists, our international panel of experts. Uh, you are wonderful. You gave us uh, your view from three different perspectives and obviously the subject is huge and there will be not enough time even for one week of training but in this one hour we manage uh, to grasp all the latest trends and we, we manage to grasp uh, where, where we have to start at least thank you so much for being with us and uh, before i close this uh, webinar uh, i would like to ask everyone uh, to stay connected with us uh, to follow us uh, to to be part of our group 
And when we conclude the webinar, there will be opportunity for you uh, to share uh, the feedback uh, through survey. Please stay for the survey and we see you very soon. Thank you so much, the panelists. Thank you so much. See you very soon. Hope we will travel again. All the best. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.